In this video, we're going to look at the mathematical basis of why chemically equivalent protons do not split each other in NMR spectra. I've got this molecule here, and this is, let's see, two carbons, so it's an ethane, uh, looks like 1122 tetrachloroethane. So it's got two protons, and they're each on different carbons. But you'll notice this, they're uh, chemically equivalent because they're each attached to a CCL2H group, they're each attached to a carbon that's attached to a chlorine, a chlorine. So if you if you rotated this molecule, you can make it look just like the other one. So there's no chemical distinction between these two protons. They're what we call chemically equivalent. Okay, so let's write down the Hamiltonian for this system in terms of the NMR spectra. So our Hamiltonian is going to include terms for the coupling of the magnetic field with the magnetic moment of our first proton. So we'll call, we'll pick one of these, call it proton one. And that's gonna be minus gamma, the magnetogyric ratio from previous videos. The default magnetic, external magnetic field, B naught, times one minus the shielding constant of that proton. Let's call that sigma A as I've called this A2 for these two protons here, and then times the Z component of the spin angular momentum operator for the nucleus, for Z1, minus, and we have the same thing for the interaction of the magnetic moment of proton 2 with the external magnetic field. It has the same magnetogyric ratio gamma, same external magnetic field, it's chemically equivalent, so it has the same chemical environment, so it has the same shielding constant, and then times the operator for its Z component of its uh, nuclear spin angular momentum. And then we include the coupling as well, which continuing on the next line is going to be plus, we've defined that coupling operator to be H coupling constant, JAA, so I'm going to call it the coupling between these two here over h bar squared. This makes sure that JAA is in the unit of hertz. Coupling constants are usually done in terms of hertz. And then we have the dot product of the total angular momentum operators for proton one and proton two. So it's how they're coupled affects how they split one another. Because each of these with their magnetic dipoles creates a magnetic field, which the other one responds to, and that's going to affect their energy levels. So just like before, we're gonna use first order perturbation theory. So we're gonna define a reference Hamiltonian H0, which is just the first two terms up here, minus gamma B naught times one minus sigma A. And you notice that part was the same for both of our protons here. So we can actually factor out our operators here, IZ1 plus IZ2. So that's our zero order, or reference Hamiltonian. And then we define our perturbation, our perturbation operator, H1, which is going to be HJAA over H bar squared times the dot product or the correlation between the magnetic, uh, the total nuclear spin in your momentum of proton one and proton two. Okay. Now we're gonna define some states. So these are gonna be the states that we can have proton one and proton two be in, in terms of their nuclear spin, spin up or spin down, alpha or beta. So we're gonna have phi one equals, proton one and proton two are both alpha, they're both spin up, so that's phi one. We're gonna define phi four, which is going to be both of them spin down, spin beta. Now we're gonna define two states in the middle. And here's where it gets uh, tricky relative to the previous example. Because these two protons are chemically equivalent, um, they're now, since they're equivalent, um, we have to obey the rules of spin statistics and selection and all those types of things, you know, Pauli exclusion principle, that type of stuff. So what we have to have here is we have to construct linear combinations because we don't know which one is spin up or in which one is spin down. This is kind of similar to the type of Slater determinants that we had built for 
electron spin in previous videos on that. So what we're going to define here are two states. We're going to have 1 over square root of 2 for a normalization constant of alpha 1 beta 2 minus beta 1 alpha 2. So you see that kind of disguises. We don't know which one is spin up and which one is spin down. So we have both of the states there. And that's going to be our anti-symmetric combination of the two. Then we have another state, which is the symmetric combination, where we're adding them together, plus beta 1 alpha 2. And what ends up being the case is due to selection rules, you have to go to states with the same symmetry with respect to exchange. So if you exchange the two protons here, you end up with the same state. If you exchange the two protons here, you end up with the same state. Exchange them there, you end up with the same state. Exchange them there, you end up with the same state with a minus sign in front. So that's why we call that an anti-symmetric combination. So our selection rules actually forbid us for, from transferring from any of these other states into phi 2. So that one's going to be canceled out on our spectrum, as we see over here on the right, that we'll eventually get to. OK, so then we would just go and do the first order perturbation theory and calculate what the actual energy values of these are. We go through that in more detail in the first video on spin-spin coupling. So I'm going to skip to the Cliff Notes version here. So what we have is we're going to have E1, energy of state 1, is going to be the, the default energy of that being h bar gamma b naught times 1 minus sigma a. And then plus the effect of the coupling, which is going to be h j a a over 4. That works exactly the same as the previous video. We're going to have E4, which is just going to be plus h bar gamma, get that out of there, gamma b naught times 1 minus sigma a. And that also gets shifted up, h j a a over 4. In each of these cases, the protons have the, have the same spin, spin up or spin down. So that correlation creates a field which opposes their energy levels. It pushes them up in energy. It's unfavorable for them to be correlated. So that's the same as, pre as before. And now the difference comes in the middle because we have E2. Um, in the previous videos, we show how you get uh, integrals which depend on the x, the y, and the z components of this operator here. In the other states, uh, the x and y components cancel. But in these states, because you have this combination here, this, these linear combinations, the way the x and, x and y components of these operators work, you actually get non-zero contributions from those as well. So it's actually fairly involved, and I'm not going to work through all of it. But what you end up with is that E2 ends up being minus 3HJA over, over 4 relative to 0. Its, it's energy without coupling is 0. And then E3 ends up being plus HJAA over 4. Again, shifted up from 0. This one shifted down from 0. And once again, due to our selection rules, this one's going to get uh, tossed out. OK, so what does this leave us with in terms of our spectrum? So what we're left with is we're going to have, we have the possibility of going from state 1 to state 3 without coupling, which is state 1, alpha, alpha, up into a state where one of them is alpha and one of them is beta. Or we can transition from 3 to 4, where we have one alpha and one beta, to them both being beta in terms of absorbing a photon and jumping our energy levels. So there are two possible values of the peak there. And they're both the same. These are both the same uh, distance in terms of what that frequency is. And then th we're going to shift here. But you'll notice what we're shifting by is the same value every time. So going from 1 to 3, they both get shifted up by HJAA over 4. And going from 3 to 4, they both get shifted up by HJAA over 4. So there's no difference in the peaks when they're coupled relative to when they're not coupled. So that actually, so our, our, our spectrum here isn't going to show multiple peaks. 
because each of these peaks has the same energy has the same energy difference and then coupling them as well doesn't result in any energy difference because they all get shifted up by the same amount due to the fact that these chemical shifts are the sorry these shielding constants are the same unless those chemical shifts are going to be the same okay so this gives us our frequencies for these absorptions nu13 which is equal to e3 minus e1 over h delta e equals h nu equals gamma beta naught magnetic field 1 minus sigma a over 2 pi and if you go through and do all the substitutions here in terms of what beta b naught is and all those things what you end up with is the spectrometer frequency nu naught times 1 minus sigma a so you end up with the same frequency of absorption you would have got if these two were not coupled and similarly for 3, 4, as I said, when we verbally went through that E4 minus E3 over H, delta E equals H nu equals, that also works out to the same value. It's going to be gamma B naught times 1 minus shielding constant sigma A over 2 pi. And then again, the formula which connects B naught and nu naught, the magnetic field of absorption and the spectrometer frequency is going to be nu naught times 1 minus sigma a. So the reason that we don't get coupling between chemically equivalent protons is not because they're not coupled. They are coupled, but the shifts in the energy levels are equivalent for all of the energy levels. So it doesn't actually change what the frequency of absorption is, even though it is changing the energy levels of the protons.